All right, well, good morning. Good to see you this morning. Everybody good? Glad to have you today. I'll just say you're looking good. I don't even have my glasses on. Hey, well, we're glad to have you. Just a couple announcements. You can see bulletins, uh, bulletin, what we have going on. Um, one thing I'll highlight, we do have business meeting tonight at, at uh, 7, right after Love and Respect. So I uh, invite you to uh, be a part of, of that. Um, and I believe that's all I'm going to highlight today. Well, let's, uh, let's start out with a word of prayer. Lord, we come to you this morning, and we thank you so much for this time. I thank you for each one that's here, God. We ask that to this morning that you would bless this service, that you would use every bit of it as we bring glory to you. Um, Lord, we ask that you move in our midst, and we ask this in your name. Amen. Again, uh, welcome to First Baptist Church. We're glad that you're here this morning. If you're visiting with us, I ask you to do one thing. There's a little trifold there. If you would uh, tear that off and fill it out and stick it in the offer plate, it comes by in a few minutes. Now, if you would at this time, um, go ahead and greet those right around you and tell them you're glad to see them. I'm going to have you come up right after that. quick seat. I'm going to have Dan Eves. He's the chairman of our finance and uh, he wants to share with you a little bit. You've seen some stuff we've been doing around our building and um, you'll notice the, the beautiful ceiling now that's not um, falling on your head or anything like that. So that's, that's a blessing. So Dan, go ahead and share okay. a little bit about that. Okay. If you're a member, you did receive a, a letter. I hope you received a letter from Pastor Joe. Um, and in his letter, he, of course, always talks about our, our ministry in, in New Coin and, and mentioned our buildings and the repairs and, and referred back to the approval that we received in, uh, uh, it was either November, December, I don't always remember all the time. Um, and it was for a credit line of $140,000, and that was for all the, the, the various repairs, and of course, the big thing was air conditioners there's three up in the ceiling and then after that was done the ceiling was repainted and then I think there's some tuck pointing going on right now but we've drawn sixty six thousand dollars on the credit line and I guess uh, it's just time for me to say it's time to give to the building fund um, that's how we paid the, the uh, big building off and of course we use the uh, campaign of beyond measure and I'm very proud to say, and we all should be of the $1.4 $1 million 
dollar uh, building that we paid off in six years. Amen. You, you talk to people outside of our church and tell them that, and they're just totally amazed. So we are a giving church. We, we are committed to this church. We are the church. We're committing to having our buildings and, and having what it takes to deliver the ministry in this community. So with that said, you know, last time we did the beyond measure thing, we actually asked for a signed commitment. So we're, we're not going to do that now. I'm just going to ask you to, to, to pray about your relationship with God. Pray about how you feel about our church, the church family, and, and start giving it monthly, weekly, whatever works for you. But we'd like to get this paid off. I doubt we'll ever get to the 140000 if we can keep paying it. And I'll just give you an example. If we get $2,000 in on Sunday, we're going to pay that $2,000 on Monday to the bank. And that's how we'll do it. It's a revolving credit, but it, it, we, withdraw, we draw on it as we go and pay it back as we go. So just pray about it. Um, we know what we can do here. And let's just get it paid off quickly. Thank you. Would you stand? We're going to sing hymn number 350. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. Nothing. 
Emptied of his glory, God became a man to walk on earth in ridicule and shame. A ruler, yet a servant, a shepherd, yet a is crumbled like a mighty wall. The stone that held him in was rolled aside. The prince of life in glory was lifted over all. Now earth and heaven echo with the cry. He is Lord, he is Lord. He is risen from the dead and he is Lord. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Listen as the choir sings, where could I go from your spirit?
love that will not let me go. In number 292. Most gracious God, we thank you, Lord, that we can be in your house this morning, worship you in, the, in, the, in song. And we just ask right now, Lord, that you be with our pastor, Brother Joe, as he presents the message. 
Lord, we just pray, God, that we would hear it, we would understand it, and we would apply it, Lord, to our, our everyday lives. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Good to see you this morning. Thanks uh, again for being here. Um, I want to kind of tell you where we're going to be going. I'm excited about this particular series. You want to, I wonder if we can put that, that graphic up. Um, we're going to begin a series today on spiritual warfare. And I'll just tell you, I've never, I've never really taught on spiritual warfare. Um, and so it ought to be kind of interesting Already I had a lot of comments after, after our first service. So um, we'll start it like, well, I'll tell you what, let's pray and then we'll, we'll jump into this. Lord Jesus, we just come to you today and we thank you so much, Lord, for all that you do for us. As we begin to jump into this series this morning, I just pray that you'll speak to our hearts. Lord, have your way in our lives and in our church and in everything. So we ask this in your name. Amen. So let me start with some questions this morning. Let me just see where you're at. Have you ever felt like quitting because the hassle of being a Christian seems to be too much? Have you ever had doubts about the truth of God's word? Have you ever felt overwhelmed by maybe depression? 
Have you ever felt condemned by your past sins? Um, have you ever been haunted by like remarks, cutting remarks that, that people will make or, or bad thoughts or desires that you just couldn't get out of your head? Or maybe you actually heard voices and you don't want to tell anybody about it, but maybe, maybe you did. Or maybe you're, this morning you're filled with bitterness or unforgiveness and you don't like that, but it keeps coming up. See, here's what I'll tell you. We've all been attacked. We've all been wounded. And all of us in here are in the middle of a war. We're all in the middle of, of a war. Um, and I want to talk about that war for the next several weeks. Recently, I heard a guy put it like this. He was talking about, he's a well-known pastor in, in the Memphis area. He was talking about spiritual warfare, and he told this story. He said several years ago, he was setting up, uh, going to plant a church in the Memphis area, um, a multiracial, uh, multi-ethnic, multicultural, right in the center of, of Memphis. And he explains that when you do something like that, spiritual warfare is going to attack you. You're going to get The devil doesn't like it, right? And so he told how his first two years of ministry there at, in, in Memphis, he experienced what he suspected to be demonic attacks. Here's, here's his first two years. He said his small kids um, would have night terrors every single night. He said their car was broken into numerous times. He'd never really been sick in his life, and he, all of a sudden, when he went there to start playing in his church, he got sick all the time. He said he never struggled with lust and pornography before, but he began to experience severely heightened temptation. His finances took a hit. He, he had all these things happen, crazy stuff. He experienced irrational fears. He thought for, the, for the, the, those two years, he, he had this irrational fear that his wife was going to leave him. Didn't know why, but it, it did. He had those fears. Well, it's funny, he said, when he flew out of Memphis, it felt like a weight came off of him. Couldn't figure it out. And here's what I'll tell you. You can write all that stuff off. You can say, well, that's just a coincidence. It's just in his mind. Um, and I'll tell you, we are a product of the post-enlightenment you know, era. And we, we think, well, the stuff like that's a product of our mind. Or we, I remember growing up, I would hear these, I'll just use the word, kooky Christians who would uh, talk about spiritual warfare. And I'd be like, what is that? I'm a Baptist. And we, I don't know about that. But here's what I know. So many of us, we read the Bible, right? We read the Old Testament and we read the New Testament and we see these things happen. We see God, we, we hear about Satan, we read about it. We see angels, we see demons in, in the Bible. And we think, well, that happened way back then, but it doesn't happen now. That's stuff that, that Hollywood dreams up, Right? And, and I'll just be honest with you, that's kind of how I grew up, kind of thinking that way. But I want you to listen to something that Paul says this morning to us. If you have your Bibles, I'll invite you to turn to Ephesians chapter 6, and we're going to start right here this morning, as we do an introduction today on spiritual warfare. Um, Ephesians 6, Paul's got some words for us. We'll start in verse 10, and here is what Paul says. <coughs> There we go. He says this. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. And let me just say this, what Paul's talking about here is the fact that when you become a Christian, if you give your life to Jesus Christ, what's going to happen when you become a Christian, you enter a war and you enter a war against Satan, right? Um, and the word there, it says to wrestle. I don't know if you see it in verse 12. The word wrestle there literally means um, kind of, it means to struggle, 
It means hand-to-hand -hand combat. A lot of y'all may not watch this, but there's something on TV called MMA. And you know, that's, it, it used to be boxing, now it's like kickboxing and everything else in it. That's the idea here. It's hand-to-hand -hand combat. And most of you think that your enemy is, is somebody it's not. See, we think our enemy's flesh and blood. Some of you can think of, anybody here got somebody that just irritates the mess out of you? Yeah, it's you, Joe. Yeah, okay, I got it. Okay, here's what Paul says. Paul says, your enemy is not flesh and blood. But it's, it's, it's spiritual in nature. And I'll tell you this, the American Christian, the American church, um, it is the most unprepared for this battle than, than ever before, right? I, I don't, and, and one of the reasons why I want to do this is because I don't want you to be unprepared. I want us to know how, how to, uh, to fight. So the next several weeks, we're going to be looking at spiritual warfare. And, and let me start with this. From the very beginning of the Bible, it's about, two, about an unseen realm and a seen realm. Right? There's, there's, two, there's two realms. And, and faith requires us to believe that there are beings as real as we are, right, who live in a world as real as ours and travel between those two worlds. Right? And they impact um, and they affect human uh, existence, human history. And as a, as a result of that, everything is spiritual. Right? Um, and what happens in the invisible world affects the visible world, and what happens in the visible world affects the invisible world. You say, well, how do you know? Prove it, Job. Well, all you got to do is read Job. Read the first several chapters of Job. It starts out with um, God in his throne room, and then he, sa he has all the sons of God. It says, come, and they come, and they stand before him, and he, he looks at Satan, and he says, Satan, what have you been doing? Oh, sipping a latte, right? I've been roaming around. He goes, have you seen my servant Job? He goes, yeah, I've seen him, and he doesn't serve you because he serves you because he gets something out of it. He goes, just take away some of those things, and he'll, he'll, he'll curse you, right? And this is all happening in the unseen realm. But we know all the things that happened to Job in the seen realm, in the physical realm. So over and over, you have these things that happen. What happens in the invisible realm affects the, the visible realm. And, and by the way, furthermore, you as a person have a physical body that you can see, and you also have an unseen part called your soul that you can't see. Right, so spiritual war, by the way, is like gravity. It, it, it exists whether you want to believe it or not. It, it does exist. Okay? So Christianity over the years has really downplayed this and, and um, has kind of dismissed it other than like charismatics and, and Pentecostals. We don't talk about this very, very much. Um, now, the reason is this. Rationalism, which came right after the Enlightenment. Let me, let me just give you a little bit of history. Rationalism, which means this. If you can't see it in the telescope, if you can't see it under the microscope, if you can't prove it by the scientific method, then it doesn't exist. So like, for instance, we know gravity exists because we, in a laboratory setting, I can do this right here. What happens every time? My glasses drop. Why do they drop here? Why don't they just keep floating? Because of gravity. Now here's the problem with that thinking. The supernatural, you can't do that with. For instance, God came into history and, and Jesus was ro rose from the grave. You can't put that in a laboratory and watch it work. It happened once. God did it. It was supernatural. It wasn't natural. So we have the naturalism that, that happens. If you, they believe that if you can't prove it in the scientific method, then it doesn't happen. And that leads to naturalism, which is a worldview that suggests basically all we have is the material world, which leads to agnosticism and atheism. Right? Now, Martin Luther... It was kind of an interesting story about him. Martin Luther, one of the great um, reformers, there's, there's a kind of a, a pretty cool thing that happened. He believed in the cosmic battle, right, between God and, and Satan. And what, um, over the years, as uh, Martin Luther 
was doing some of the things he's doing. One time he was at the Wartburg Castle and he was translating the Bible. And the devil appeared to him and it freaked him out so bad he took his inkwell and he threw it at, threw it at where the devil was standing. Of course, it didn't hit him because he's spirit. But there, when it hit the wall, it broke and splattered all over the wall, this ink spot. For years, hundreds of years later, people, when they would take the Wartburg uh, Castle tour, they would show the spot of ink. Say, this is where the devil appeared when on Luther in his room, and he threw the inkwell. And he threw the inkwell at him, and it, it, it burst. Guess what? If you go to that castle today, you can't find that. Because what historians believe is they painted over it. They painted over it because they said it was a silly superstition, which kind of under, makes us understand the rest of church history from then on. But I'll tell you this, the battle is real. There's a real battle going on, and anyone who chooses to be on the side of the Lord Jesus Christ is going to face opposition. Jesus said that, right? It's interesting, though, that the Bible, when it talks, uh, it uses this picture of a military battle. In, in, in Paul, in 2 Timothy, he was talking to Timothy, and he says, be a good soldier, 2 Timothy chapter 3. The next chapter over, he says, when he, he's getting ready to die in chapter 4, and he says, um, he says basically that I fought the good what? Fight. Because it is about a fight. One time, the, uh, Jesus is talking to his followers. And he, he tells them, you're going to go out into the world. And he says, and the gates of hell will not prevail. You remember that? And there's a lot that could be saying. Um, we don't understand all of it, but here's what we do understand. Back in those days, uh, one of the tactics of battle was you had to, when you're going to take over a city, you had to take your battering ram and ram down those gates so you could get in there to conquer the city. What Jesus is saying is the gates are going to fall of Satan's realm. It's a battle, right? And, and one other thing I want you to see here before we move on is this. Look at verse 11. It says there, the schemes of the devil. I don't know. Do you know? You see that there? And what I'll tell you is this. The word for schemes in Ephesians chapter 6 is the word methodia, which means to craft deceit. It means deceive. It's, it's uh, it, it, the way he works, the devil, is he tries to deceive you. Right? Um, and what it means is the devil is really sneaky. He's, re he's really uh, crafty. He's really deceiving. And here's the thing. I want you to know this because the devil wants, the way he, this war goes, it's a truth war. And the way he works is he wants to try to, to get into your mind and mess with your mind. Now, the Bible teaches a dualistic way to view the world. Christians think in terms, in other words, Christians think in terms of black and white. And we talked about this one other time, but... Um, they think in, in binary thinking. I guess that's the way you should do it. Non-Christians think in shades of gray. Right? But Christians think in black and white. Um, from the beginning of the Bible to the very end, you get, you get God, Satan. You get angels. You get demons. You get, um, you get wolves. You get shepherds. Right? You get lies. You get truth. It's binary right? Uh, you get spirit-filled, Holy Spirit-filled. You get unholy spirit-filled. I could keep going on and on. You get humility. You get pride. You get forgiveness. You get unforgiveness. You see what I'm saying? Mainstream culture is monistic. And remember, we, we talked about this several weeks ago. The culture does not believe in black and white. They don't believe uh, in other words, the culture refuses to have any categories. And the reason is because uh, if you make distinctions, then what you're actually doing, you're going to have to make a value judgment on something. Right? And so here's what we have in the culture. How, how many of you, by the way, have ever seen that, that um, yin and yang sign? It's like a circle and it has good in it and evil in it. Everything's in the one. That's monistic thinking. The Bible is... Uh, dualistic thinking. In other words, here's God, here's creation. He's not a part of creation, he's above creation. All right? And, and, and it works this way. Let me show you what monistic thinking looks like. All right? So, for instance, instead of God and Satan, you just have a higher power. Just all one. 
Instead of demons and angels, we have ghosts and spirits. See, 1 John says that it's not ghosts and spirits. You better test the spirits because there's evil spirits and there are good spirits. All right? I, I can keep going. Instead of sin and holiness, we have lifestyle choices. That, that's how the world thinks. Right? Instead of wolves and shepherds, we have spiritual guides. And they're not bad ones and good ones. They're just, they're just guides. Instead of non-Christians and Christians, everybody's God's child. And I could go on and on, but that, that's the idea there. And ultimately, if you believe Scripture, then you believe that there's a battle. And, uh, and this battle is between the God of the Bible, right, and the gods of this world who are at war against him. And it's a truth war, right? So as we talk about this more, it, it is, it's a truth war. And what you have is you have God that creates things, and what you have is Satan who can't create anything, but you know what he does? He corrupts everything. See, Satan is all is against everything. He's just against everything. So, so God creates. You got metal. And see, God, you can have... Well, I don't know if I get... No, I'm not going to jump into that because that'll put me off. So God creates angels. We'll just do it like this. The devil corrupts angels and, and you have demons. You see what I'm saying? You can have metal, but you can't have rust without metal. God creates Satan and create anything. All he does is corrupt. Make sense? So I could keep going and we'll, as we go through the study, you're going to see some of this. But the war is for your mind. And it's a truth battle. You say, well, Joe, how did this war start? Where did this thing all start? Well, good question. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 28. Let me show you something this morning. In Ezekiel 28, what you're going to do, we're going to have to go way back. And um, when God created angels, he created all the angels. He, he, he created one angel in particular named Lucifer. Uh, if you have the King James Bible, you'll see that word appear. Now, some people debate whether that's a name or not, but I, I pretty much think it might be. Now, again, I'll say this. Um, when we talk about Lucifer, we're not talking about the guy on the TV show on Fox called Lucifer, the fallen angel, right? Because what they try to do is, is portray this fallen angel as a misunderstood creature, if you watch the show, by the way, some of you are going, what are you talking about up there? There is a show on Fox called Lucifer. And he's portrayed as a um, misunderstood angel. He just, God, didn't, nobody understands him. Kind of like the song from the Rolling Stones called Sympathy for the Devil. He's trying to get sympathy. But let me show you what actually happened so, you, so you'll know. In Ezekiel chapter 28... The, um, the context goes like this. In the first 11 verses of chapter 28, he's talking to the prince of Tyre. He's talking to the ruler of Tyre. And then right when you get to verse 12, something changes. And he starts talking, and you'll see it. Let me show you. But uh, he starts talking to, to an angel, talking about an angel. Here, here's what it says. Verse 12. Son of man, raise a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, you are the signet of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You are in Eden, the garden of God. By the way, the king of Tyre, who's alive at this time of Ezekiel, wasn't in the garden of Eden. So this is talking about something else, right? So right in the middle, that's why you know. He says, you are in Eden, the garden of God, and every precious stone was your covering, sardis, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle, and crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. You were an anointed guardian cherub. I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God. In the midst of the stones and fire, you walked. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till the unrighteousness was found in you. In abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence in your midst and you sinned. So I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of God and I destroyed you. O guardian cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire, your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground, and I exposed you before kings to feast their eyes on you. Now, let me just point out a couple things here 
First is this. In verse 12 and 13, uh, Satan, by the way, is not a red devil with a little uh, tail, with a little pointy tail with a pitchfork. All right, I know we, all, we play uh, Murfreesboro, and they're the red devils. That's not who this is. In fact, the Bible says here that he said that he was created beautiful, a model of perfection. When God made Satan, he made a perfect angel. All right, and it says here that he was full of wisdom, which means he was created as one of the wisest creations of God that he made. He was beautiful, and, um, and in fact, the, the name there, Lucifer, depending on the version you're using, means the shining one. It means uh, light from heaven, and it means to praise or to boast. Um, and what this is saying is, if you read the Bible and you, and you read about the cherubim and the seraphim, you know what their job was, what they did over and over again? Uh, they would go before the throne of God, if you read about it in different places, Isaiah, um, and they would praise and they'd boast of God. That was Satan's job. You know, Satan was the praise leader. Satan was the praise leader, and he was to lead all of the unseen realm in praising God, to lead people to worship God. And, and by the way, the, the idea there is to reflect God's glory. And that's what his creation is supposed to do to reflect God's glory. Um, one other verse, look at verse 14. It talks about there, just for the sake of time, I won't go into all this, but he had face-to-face -face access with God. He was on the mount of God. And that's, by the way, when it talks about that and you see that, so many times it's talking about the throne of God. Satan was in the throne room of God. So you say, okay, so he was created beautiful. He was created with, to be wise. He was the, the praise leader. So what happened? Now look at verse 15. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. Verse 17. Your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. Satan, the father of lies, lies to himself. Basically, he thought he was the source of his own beauty, the source of his own authority, the source of his own wisdom, and he refused to acknowledge that everything that he had came from God, right? He no longer wanted to submit to God's authority. What he did, he says, man, I don't need God. I won't be my own God. I'm going to do what I want. You ever heard that before? The prophet Isaiah in chapter 14 of Isaiah says it like this. Now, just listen. This is chapter 14, starting in verse 12. It says, How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, O son of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground. You who laid the nations low, you said in your heart. Listen, this is what Satan said in his heart. He says, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend from the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. I don't know if you caught this. Do you hear all those I wills? I will do this, I'll do that. In fact, there are five of them. He says, I'll ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne. I will sit on the mount. I will ascend above the heights. I'll make myself like the most high. See, until Satan did this, there was only one will in the universe, and that was God's will. And then when Satan rebels, uh, by the way, when it was God's will, everything was in perfect harmony. Now, there's a lot of people that think that we're going to get a government, whether we're a Republican or Democrat or whatever, that if we could just get a certain government, that's going to make us in perfect harmony. No way. <laughs> they, apparently, they have not read the Bible. When Satan came in, by the way, you know what? I, I told you this a couple weeks ago. You know what division is? Division is die means two. Vision means vision. Division means two visions. Satan wants to divide. That's what he's called. He's the observer. He wants to divide. And so what he does is he, he puts another vision in for God. That's what he does right here. Now there's two wills. He wants to remove God off of his throne and take his place. He wants to be like the Most High. He was determined to be his own God and have all the other creatures worship him. By the way, you know what the thing that got Satan wants is pride. Let me just say just a word or two about that. A lot of people are like, oh man, pride's not that big a deal. I mean, 
And you think about this. What, I mean, we, we're taught to have pride. Now, it's a little different than what we're talking about here, but it's, it's like a, a national pastime. In America, we need pride. And we think pride's not that big a deal. God says in the scriptures that God is opposed to the, what? Proud. That's what got Satan was pride. Right? So, by the way, you know what the national, the, the national religion of hell is? Pride. So let me ask you today, what motivates you? What are your ambitions? What are you promoting? I mean, if I looked at your Facebook page, what would I, some of you watch Facebook? Well, if I looked at your Facebook page, what would I see? What would God see? Do you have this need for power, to be in control? Is it by being demanding, pushy, observing, climbing over people? That's what Satan does. That's, that, by the way, that's just pride. And, and I noticed this um, in, in Philippians. I, I'm not going to read it this morning, but in Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 5, it talks about a Christian is to have this mind in him. It's the mind of Christ Jesus. And it says that he um, willingly humbled himself, even unto death. Right? Is your speech full of I wills or Lord wills? In James, it talks about, in chapter 4, um, it says, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade to make a profit, yet you do not know what tomorrow brings. What's your life? For you're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you should say, if the Lord, what? Wills, we will do this and do that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance and all such boasting is evil. Listen to me. If you're running your own life instead of letting God run your life, um, then you're trying to be like the most high. You're trying to be like God. We got to be like the 24 elders in, in Revelation chapter 4. They're all before the throne of God. And here's what they say over and over again. They say, worthy are you, O Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things. And by you, you're... And by your will, they existed and were created. Now, pride got Satan, right? In Ezekiel 28, what we read, here's what happened. So I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O guardian cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom. For the sake of your splendor, I cast you to the ground. I expose you before kings to feast their eyes on you. Now that's Ezekiel 28. Now let me just read you. In, in, in Revelation chapter 12, there's a parallel passage to this, and it says it like this. Same thing. War arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. By the way, who's the dragon? Satan. And the dragon and his angels fought back. Now and let me just say this too. This is free. I'm not getting this into my notes. Notice in that passage in, in Revelation, you know who's fighting the devil? My, this is Michael and his angels. Is God fighting? No. You know what God could have done? All God has to do to Satan, Satan's a created being. He's not finite. There's, he's not all powerful. He's not all knowing. God could have went, bing, and he's gone. Because he, if you put God on a scale and Satan, he don't even come up to the scale. You can't even see him. So God lets his angels Michael and his angels fight, and guess what happens? God wins, because here's what it says. It says, now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but was, he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for him in heaven, and the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Satan gets expelled. And, and he gets expelled from heaven, and the Bible says he's thrown down. He didn't just go, well, I guess I'm beat and, and strut out. No, old boy was thrown out. The Bible says that they took him and they threw him out. He face planted on the earth. He gets, he gets thrown out like a commanding military officer that's trying to do a coup, and he can't, he can't get it done, and he's thrown out. And by the way, the Bible says here that with Satan, he took, uh, in another place, it talks about a third of the angels with him. 
We don't know how many angels there are, but he took, he's got a lot of principalities. We, it says that in Ephesians 6. Um, there's counterfeit angels. There's uh, rulers, uh, hosts, elemental spirits. It's all over. And the great war in heaven is won by God. Now, here's the deal. We're going to talk about this next week. But the battle in heaven is over, but it comes to earth. And we'll see what happens on earth next week. It's kind of an interesting. If you want to read ahead, read uh, Genesis chapter 3. We'll talk about what happens on earth. But I want, to, I want to stop here and just say this. You know, when it comes to spiritual warfare, um, there's a lot going on that your eyes can't see. Just a fact. And um, I wonder this morning if you need to see that. One of the things kind of interesting throughout the Bible, you'll see places where God will open the people's eyes. One time Balaam's on a donkey in, in uh, Numbers chapter 22, and he's yelling at his donkey, poor donkey. And the donkey actually talks and says, hey, stupid. And uh, I don't know if he said that or not. He probably said something meaner. But anyways, the donkey um, is, won't go forward. And then all of a sudden, God opens Balaam's eyes, and he sees that angel with the sword in his hand. His eyes were open. Another time, Elisha the prophet was in his house sipping on a latte, and his, his, uh, his servant comes in and goes, Hey, I just went outside, and we are surrounded by an army. The Syrian army is outside. And I love Elisha's response. He's just sitting there going, Can you make me another shot? <laughs> you know, he's just sitting there drinking his tea or his coffee, sipping away. And he goes, oh boy. And he says, God, would you please open my servant's eyes? And all of a sudden, the servant's eyes were open and he could see reality, the physical and the unseen. And around that army was God's army. Now, I say all that to say this. See, some of you in here, you say, you know what, Joe? I've had a week. I feel like I have been attacked. Somebody, I just got rolled this week. If there's, there's, I, I just feel like I've been beaten down. And here's what I want to say to you. Maybe you have. Actually, maybe you have. See, this war is real, and you, you, sometimes what we need to understand is it's a spiritual war. Right? There's a spiritual war going on. We need our eyes open. And listen, if you're a believer in Christ and you start trying to live your life for him, you're going to be a target. Now, the only other thing I want to say and we're done is this. Is if you're not a Christian this morning, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you're on the wrong team. Right? That team's already lost. It lost the war. You see, you're either on Jesus' team or you're on Satan's team. And my prayer for you today is this, as we, as we close out, is that if you're not on Jesus' team, that he would open your eyes and let you see reality because it says that the, that the prince of this world has blinded the eyes of the people. And that he would open your eyes and that you would put your faith and your trust in Jesus. So we're getting ready to have an invitation. I just want to say this. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ, you're on the wrong team. And if you're on, if you're on the right team, if you're on Jesus' team, you better get your helmet on because <laughs> it's coming. Hey, listen, when we start talking about this, you, you kick over a, a bee's nest, what happens? They start swarming. There's going to be some things happen. All right? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we, uh, we come to you this morning. And Lord, I don't know where each person's at in here, but you know everybody's heart because you're all knowing and you know everything. And so this morning as we get into this, um, we start looking at your word and we start talking about some of this, God, um, there's some in here that have been attacked. It just, things have happened. And they're struggling right now. God, and they need encouragement. They need, they need the, the church to come around them, Lord, and, 
And, and Lord, when they're down, then we come around and pick them up and get them back in the fight. So, Lord, I, I, I believe there's some in here that are like that. They've just been rolled this week. There's some in here that might, again, not be on the team. And, and they feel that tug. They feel that, that they need to put their faith and trust in you. And so, Lord, I pray that even this morning in this room with your spirit, that you would draw people to yourself. God, have, have your way. As we do this invitation, Lord, if there's someone here that needs to join, maybe there's someone here that needs to be baptized, someone here needs to make a public profession of faith, we ask that, God, you give courage to do that. So we open this up to you, and we ask this in your name. Amen. So I'm going to ask you, Floyd, to stand with me. So we come to this time. Um, we're going to sing a song. If you want to come, maybe you need prayer this morning, whatever. Um, the, the altar's open. We'd love to pray with you. And, um, if you need to make a decision of any kind, you do that as we sing. God bless you. Thanks for being here today. I, I pray that your day goes well. Remember tonight, we, uh, we're, we're doing a marriage study called Love and Respect and Be in the Family Life Center, and then we'll have a business meeting right after that. I pray, uh, I think tomorrow's in, uh, is it a federal holiday or something, President's Day. So I pray that your day goes well tomorrow and that you have a wonderful day. Um, be in prayer for our church, and, and let's, let's pray that God's going to move. Amen. If you want to, again, read Genesis chapter 3 because the battle went from heaven down to earth. And we're going to talk about that battle next week. All right? So uh, let's see. Who's praying for us? I don't have my bulletin. It's Gary. Come on down. Y'all have a wonderful day. Let us pray. Most gracious heavenly Lord, we thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for just, for Joe just teaching the message, Lord. We just pray that you would let us, in this coming week, let us go out and put people in front of us, Lord, just to share your word and share your gospel, Lord. And we give us the tools to fight the enemy, Lord. Again, we wish you'd be with the ones that aren't here today because of illness or other things that couldn't make it, Lord. Again, we thank you so much for your blessing and your honor. We praise you very much. In your honor's name we pray. Amen.